Listening to Off Planet Radio at OffPlanetRadio.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. We've got a cool show tonight for you guys. One of our all for time favorite guests who never needs any introduction is with us, Robert Phoenix, and he's here to uh, help us break down. Ides of March, Venus Retrograde, Mike Pence, Jared Kushner in the OA. So let's get it started, man. How you doing, Robert? I'm doing great. It's uh, one of the first days we've had in weeks without chemtrails. I wanted to, you know, kiss the ground and the sky simultaneously. And let's hope we can roll this for a while. It seems like since Trump's been elected, they've just completely upped the the spraying all over the country. Yeah, it's major. Everybody, everybody is complaining. I mean, it really started back in January. I'd say three quarters of America got sick, seriously sick. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think we're all getting sick and tired of what's happening up in the sky. And nobody ever talks about it. There's never any mention. The only guy that I ever had any meaningful dialogue with, with was Dennis Kucinich. And I, I hung out with Dennis briefly one day at a music festival when he was running for president. And I walked up to him. I said, hey, look, if you get elected, what are you going to do about this aerosol spraying? And he basically told me that it's real, that he knows people that have gotten sick. And he had pr- produced a, um, an aerosol, a, uh, was it, uh, an air safety bill, right? Yeah, I remember, and, yeah. And what he wanted was he wanted to um, have uh, jets explicitly list the ingredients in their jet fuel, or what was coming out of their plane. And that was his way of getting this on the public record. So Kucinich knew about it, and this was years ago. And trust me, all of these people in Washington, they all know about it. And they've either got some kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, chemical or additive or something that they take in order to doing yeah i can tell you a little bit there they have this super chelation system that they they're given that's that's one insider piece Mm -hmm. of information i've had for a few years now that they're using a super chelation formula it's not one that you and i can get although that's a good thing to do on a holistic level, but apparently there's a technology that enables them to go in and be regularly chelated to get the the toxins out of their systems. So the other, you know, the other thing that I'm curious about is what do they do with the fibers? Because the fibers are a real problem, and um, they attach to everything. They 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 transmorph into the kind of other complex forms. How do they deal with that, Randy? Do you know? No, I don't. That's still a mystery. In fact, we're, you know, it's funny. I just got a message today on Facebook from somebody who's wanted to know if we would do a show dealing with Morgellons and what the possible solutions are there. And I'm just pointing people towards Sophia Smallstorm right now because I think she's fairly authoritative on the subject. But the fibers thing is weird. That's part of the terraforming that's biological. Right. And how they're getting around it, I'm really not sure. I mean, so, so I know a little bit about this. So basically, there, uh, there's a couple of ways. So Randy's right about the chelation system, and I think there, that in some ways deals with that. But basically, the diet that I eat, like I used to have a serious problem with that, that, and the diet that I eat keeps it very much at bay. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they either eat a similar kind of diet that I eat or that they have some sort of supplement or chelation kind of system that creates the same condition in the body that I achieve by diet. Every once in a while, I'll get like a little something still, but compared to how it was, 
it's I mean, it's unbelievably better. Yeah. So basically, the same thing that caused the same environment that causes candida overgrowth is the environment that the Morgellons blossom and turn into all these other crazy things in. And so the uh, Morgellons, what it, like, oh, there's been some people who looked at it and say it's almost kind of like, um, like it's like a, a synthetic form of candida. Like a fo- they almost look exactly the same. It's a different thing, but it's a, it's a cross domain bacteria, whereas candida is a fungus. But it, it, there, it's kind of like one looks like a, a replicate, you know, like a copy of the other. It's slightly mm-hmm. different. So I think it's a matter of keeping your body in a certain condition where that's not a hospitable environment for those things to grow. And I'm sure that they know that. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, I changed my diet. And once I changed my diet, a lot of the really hardcore symptoms just went away. So there's, I think there's a management technique. Mm-hmm. I'm also convinced, though, that the, the way that they've set this up is that they have targeted certain haplogroups. Yeah, and, I agree. And up, because for some, some people just aren't affected by it any way, shape, or form. None of it, right? Yeah. And other people are really aggressively um, affected. And I, I think that they've got this thing so fine-tuned that, that it actually goes after certain genes and certain gene switches. Yeah, that's and, been published before, too, about the genetically specific vectors they're using for all sorts of things. Yeah, no, I've never read the publishing. I'm just going based on my intuition. Yeah, and no, you're right. And there is written, there is written research out there that, yeah. that, that states that flat out, that they, they, they target by spe- specific genetics. Yeah, I, I, I mean, personally, I think they're going after hunter-gatherers, paleos, uh, people with low blood types. I mean, I firmly believe that this, you and I talked about this last time, Randy, yeah. on my show, that I believe that the O blood type is one of the least manageable blood types. And I think that, 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 that Morgellons and the whole array is targeted towards that haplogroup. group. Because you take that haplogroup group out, and then you've got basically kind of a, a cast and a class of people that are much more manageable. You don't have to worry about them. That's just my two cents on it. Mm, that's I, interesting. I, I, I think that it's, I think that there's stuff to target certain groups to take them out. And there's others to target certain groups to not necessarily take them out, but to make them more manageable. You know what I mean? I think there's all, I think there's all sorts of shit going on. And I don't think it's just, I think it's a combination of things. It's, it's the stuff in the, in the chemtrails, it's the fibers, it's then hitting them with certain waves and frequencies. It's also vaccines. The vaccines come into this. GMO foods. It's like a, a, a tertiary or, qu- or quadruple kind it's of biological life. Russian roulette. Basically, you don't yeah. really know what your odds are, but you know, I, I think Robert dialed in on something there. And I yeah. think, Almost everybody that's researched this, we're, we're starting to at least get some patterns now that we can start to understand who's being targeted, why, and whatever they're doing, these substances are binary. In other words, in order for the elites to live in the same world with us and continue to piss in their own nest, they have to have some way to control at least one segment of the vector. So you have to believe that it's at least binary and that it may be you know, trinary, quadrary, how many different vectors it takes in order for them to hook into you at whatever level of malignancy they want to give you. Yeah. The only only other possibility is that they're not human and wherever they come from, that's in the environment. And so that's a preferable. Well, ultimately that that. is kind of the point. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's another factor, right? I mean, I mean, they're, they're really at home swimming in this stuff. So yeah. That's a, yeah. you know, a that accounts for yeah. the mercury and the aluminous oxide and, and, and the radiation barium. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So we have a day without chemtrails. Knock on wood. Let's see if we get a bit of a run here. And well, try I to, unfortunately try to have no chemtrails because the sky here has been under snowfall for 26 hours now. We have, um, I guess, about 16 inches on the ground. I feel it. I shoveled well, that, it. Oh. Yeah, that's a whole other beast right there. That nah, was a created storm. storm. I watched them do this. This thing was completely fermented in the upper atmosphere. One, one time, uh, we were up in Lake Tahoe. This is years ago, like uh, right around 2000 and maybe 10. And nucleated storm, huge amounts of snow. And uh, my kid um, went playing in the snow, and he got really sick. And I, I brought him in to the hotel. We had a bath, I, and he started throwing up. 
and I put some uh, baking soda and some Epsom salts in his bath. And when he got out, there was this like really long fiber. It must have been about two feet long. I don't know where it came from. Yeah. I don't know if it came from him. I don't know if it came from the residual of, of the snow on his body. But it was like, that was very strange. And I've seen people actually burn some of the snow. Right now, I did go out this morning and take a Bic lighter to it just to see if it would ignite. But apparently they got the formula a little better this time around. So they've worked it out. Yeah. Well, where do you want to go now since we've completely deconstructed chemtrails? <laughs> well, just one more thing while we're on the weather. We've had, after a fairly cold and wet winter, we've had several days of warm weather now. And we had a couple days without chemtrails. We have some today, but it's not completely covering the sky. Um, but uh, we had this, you know, a friend of mine and I were talking about the rain kind of all winter because we had much more than we usually have. And it seemed a little more natural towards the end. But some of the first heavy rains we had, we were like, this is totally fake rain. It was the weirdest thing. Like it was raining a lot, but there was no water on like the trees. Like it was, it was like this. And the, yeah, I've heard, I've heard this before. And Absolutely. the ground and the ground wasn't really wet. It was like even though there was like a ton of rain coming from the sky, it was like only wet a little bit on the top. Like it was not seeping. In. It was very. It was strange. It was like this isn't a real it's water. Non, like, almost like, non aqueous. Yeah, I mean yeah. we've seen this too. <laughs> it's really it's, it's highly unstructured water, is what it really is. I mean, whatever it is, it's a form, but it is not the form that we know as something pure that is drinkable and aqueous and has the properties of water. Yeah, I've heard of the reports from people of, um, you know, regarding this phenomena, where even where there's flooding, like massive flooding, and all of a sudden, it's, it's like there's no, you know, very little water, if any at all, has been there through the flooding. It's very strange. Yeah, yeah very it's strange. It, it, it is, it is really weird. Um, but then towards the end of the winter, we had some really heavy rains that seemed real. And for, it was really weird. Like the areas that were like totally arid before are now so green that I like, it's like we're in Ireland or something. It's really weird. <laughs> like super green. Like I'm like, I can't remember almost ever in my life seeing some of those hills look like that. It was wow. Really confusing. Yeah. So <laughs> who knows what the hell is going on <laughs> anyway so let's move on uh let's uh you had an article recently about venus retrograde we want to talk about the ides of march let's hit some astrology points uh right off the bat yeah so uh, tomorrow is the ides of march and everybody pretty much knows that you know that's when the soothsayer says to caesar you know beware the ides of march because that's when he gets taken out and that's when the roman congress and uh, Mark Anthony, Brutus, and all those guys, you know, stick it to Caesar. Uh, and that's just one event that has taken place on the Ides of March. Uh, I found a compilation of events over the years, and some of them recently, within the last 50 years, which show some really interesting phenomena, dark phenomena, and almost all of it connects in with the Zionists, the neocons, and this strange... Uh, relationship we have with um, with Israel. So uh, this 15th, tomorrow, is the 50th anniversary of the quote-unquote seizure of Jerusalem, right? By, by the Zionists came in, took it over. It's the 50th anniversary of the attack on the USS Liberty. What happened? Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, it's the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, we've got the 100th anniversary of the U.S. being deceived into World War One. It is the 100th anniversary of the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, no, a lot of people don't know this, but the Schofield Reference Bible is probably the Bible that's the one that's most used. Used by Zionists, Z dispensationalist, rapture-believing, Jesus is coming back. To, That's and right. the Jews go That's through right. the tribulation, the whole, yeah. I did radio shows on this for years. Oh, the, Sco <laughs> the Schofield Bible is, I mean, oh, yeah. the story behind the Schofield Bible is, uh, it's a real odyssey. And and along the way, you can find, like, touch points to Freemasonry. And, yeah. you know, it's a very kind of concentrated effort to get this Bible basically reconstituted the bible reconstituted annotated so that you can basically come in and 
and read the annotations and kind of get their... Well, that's what people did with that Bible. They read the annotations first, and then they read the scriptures, which meant they took them out of context so that they were... This was basically cut-and-paste theology performed in reverse engineering the Bibles by Schofield. That's right. And And Oxford... Um, Schofield is a—he's a—the the guy's a real trip, right? Yeah. He was a womanizer, and he was—he was a drinker, and then he went over to Christianity, and he got connected up with the guy who started um, the first newspaper in Dallas, who was a big-time Freemason, and that's where his odyssey for the Schofield Bible uh, takes off. Anyway, hundredth anniversary, and that book has become the blueprint of Christian Zionism. Yep. Then we have the 300th anniversary of the first Freemasonic Grand Lodge, and then the 500th anniversary of the Catholic Protestant split, which is a divide and conquer. I grabbed these from James Perloff, who's a researcher. Yeah. Mm. I just want to mm. I want to tip that to James Perloff because he put this stuff together. And so here we are again. Tomorrow, the Ides of March, the debt ceiling limit runs out tomorrow, and not a lot of people are really talking about that. And if nothing is done with that debt ceiling limit, uh, we'll be running on fumes into the summer. And then what do we do come summertime? Do we rise, raise the debt limit ceiling again? Or do we run out of money? Maybe that's what Trump, you know, run out of fake money. Maybe that's what Trump wants on some level so that if there's any kind of conflict or friction, it will take it off of whatever kind of, you know, bait and switch is going on with Trump. And then we have to deal with inflation, recession, whatever that, whatever that drama is. But that happens tomorrow, and the effects of that will you know, potentially leak out right around midsummer. So it's, it's kind of a big day. I did a chart for it. Um, it's a very strange chart. And one of the things that – and I did it for Washington, D.C., since it seems to be the axis moon, the center of the universe right now. And I did it at 3.15 p.m., since tomorrow is 3.15, I was just playing around with that time. And uh, the Ascendant is Leo, which is kind of connected to Trump's Ascendant, uh, although it's a much earlier Ascendant at 8 degrees. Trump's is, I believe, at 28, on his Mars is at 26. The highest planet here, again, this is tomorrow uh, at 3.15, the highest planet of the chart is Uranus, uh, which is obviously connected to chaos, disturbance, change, creativity. Uh, we've had this Mars-Uranus conjunction, and we kind of got through that. I mean, we saw some things that happened in Berkeley with the Antifa and the Trump supporters, saw some stuff happen up in Minneapolis. But I think we, we got mostly got through that kind of very intense Mars-Uranus uh, conjunction. Uh, Mars is in Taurus, so in this, in this configuration – it, you know, it's not the highest planet, but it's actually the lead planet. So everything is kind of starting with Mars. And in Taurus, it's a very different energy than Aries. It's a much slower energy. But if there's any kind of tension involved with Mars, it has a tendency to kind of build up in Taurus. And it, it tends to be like a bull in a china shop. So if we're, if we're carrying around a lot of tension, or there's a lot of tension collectively, uh, tomorrow with Mars at four degrees, right there, right around 315, it sort of reaches its peak. Now, there's an opposition going on, a very tight opposition with the moon in Scorpio. And to me, that's people losing their temper. You know, anytime you get into, you know, people want to hang on to their emotional center, um, but you have Mars over there on the other side tugging at it, and it could be kind of an explosive. And so the, the whole kind of mindset is, do I, do I maintain my emotional center or do I give in to you some kind of outburst, some kind of uh, form of exorcism in some ways? And that's kind of, that's a, that's a big dynamic throughout most of the day tomorrow, but especially tomorrow afternoon. Now, what I find really interesting here is this Mercury moon in conjunct. And Mercury is in Aries, and it's at the top of the chart. So it's got, you know, it's looking down. It's got vision. It's got perspective. It's got breadth, right? Even though sometimes Mercury in Aries has tunnel vision, up in the ninth house, it's, it's, you know, it's close to the eagle's nest. And it's got that really interesting in conjunct to the moon. And the in conjunct is a 150-degree angle where two planets, have, they're, they're separated by anywhere between two to three degrees 
And in this instance, it's only one. And they've got this 150 degree angle with a one degree separation. And they have nothing in common. Like, well, in, in a weird way, they kind of do because Mars used to be the uh, esoteric ruler of Pluto. So when, uh, when we have a Mars connection with Scorpio, there's this weird kind of, you know, sort of semi-historical and mythological and even astrological relationship. But by degree, they're really not connected. Uh, well, but in this case, they are because of the inconjunct. Now, the moon is in Scorpio. And when we get into Scorpio, what are we talking about? We're talking about the underworld, right? We're, we're getting down into the kind of the pit and getting down into the basement with, with Scorpio. And the moon in Scorpio is, is very intense. And, it, and it's, when, it, when, it's, when a moon person says moon in Scorpio and it's evolved, it's an incredible kind of moon because it's very magnetic and powerful. It can let go of certain things. It can, it can channel a lot of, a lot of sexual energy, a lot of prana. But if that moon is not evolved or it's conflicted, then you don't want to piss off a person with a Scorpio moon who's not evolved in that way because they can be very, very vindictive. It's got a, it's got a fairly vindictive energy. But the, 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 the whole idea with the moon at this part of the chart, being in the fourth house, this is like sort of the basement you know, of Washington, D.C., at 3.15 tomorrow, you know, what's going on beneath the streets of Washington, D.C.? You know, what's happening with these tunnels? Yeah. You know, what takes place, right? And, yeah. and we know, like, on some level, we know what takes place. We, we you know, we've been there. We, you know, we've seen strange pictures, and we've made well, these, you know, really. <laughs> like, this is like the moon in Scorpio. We know, like, intuitively what's going on down there. Will they be having an Will they be having an after party in the basement at Common Comet Ping Pong? Well, well, here's what's interesting, right? So we've got this Mercury in Aries, which has breadth. We can see things like there's information. Like so, on one level, we know kind of what goes on down here. Up here, we can see kind of sort of you know the pieces that are in place to some degree. But that broken green line is the inconjunct, which means we've got to find out what the connection is. Yeah, I also, the other, the, the, absolutely. And just looking at that visual, I can't help but notice that the visual, the, the dominant visual geometry of the chart is a, basically the pyramid. And then off to the side, there's sort of this thing that reminds me of like the cat's cradle that you used to do when you were younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And yeah. what is that? So, but the, the dominant geometry being like three almost concentric uh, uh, pyramids inside. Well, this is almost a classic bowl chart. If there was a if there was a planet uh, yeah. inside the seventh house, we'd have a classic bowl chart. So, in a bowl chart, it's not just the planets that are in those houses. It's the planets. It's the houses that are unoccupied. Yeah. You know, it's like what's going on over there, right? What's going on in the twelfth house? What's going on in the eleventh house? What's going on in the second house? What's going on in the first house? There are vacuums, there are voids. So for a person who has this chart, you know, they've got to figure out how to get over to that part of their chart yeah. because they need some development in that area of their life. But what's really interesting, you, you pointed this out, we've got this, you know, very intense T-square, which has been going on for a while with Pluto and square Uranus. I mean, this T-square of Pluto Uranus has been happening since around 2000 and uh 11 2012 it's been very intense it's been shaping our consciousness it's been shaping our culture pluto and capricorn is really ultimately the transformation of the hierarchy that's what that is and you know it came on real strong in 2009 when the government bailed out all these businesses and it became interstitial there was the, it was this blending this fusion this hybridization of government and big business that was pluto and capricorn but since then you know what we're trying to do now is we're trying to transform this beast and you have these uranus and aries which is this kind of you know intense sort of you know rush and crush of humanity which is aries and uranus which is like you know turning everything upside down and everybody wants a seat at the table and everybody wants their own piece of liberation so whether it's Black Lives Matter or the alt-right or Aslan Nation, whatever, right? <laughs> LGBT, Antifa, that's all Uranus and Aries. They're all lumped in one group. And in their own way, they're all doing conflict with that square with Pluto. Yeah. And this has been going on since 2011. And it's creating 
this dynamic spin, and the spin is really about deconstruction. So tomorrow at 3.15, Uranus rules the roost. And in the ninth house, it's quite interesting and radical, and it's quite experimental. But at the same time, there is also this, you know, powerful square going on Pluto in the opposition with Jupiter, which we can talk about. But you're absolutely right. T squared dominant. Now, what's interesting is, is if you look over to Pisces in the eighth house, here's the sun, here's Chiron, there's Neptune. What are they doing? They're not doing anything. They're hanging out together, right? They're kind of curdled up in the eighth house. And, and that, in a lot of ways, Pisces can be quite redemptive. There's a lot of water in Pisces. But the dominant energy for tomorrow is going to be fire. It's going to be fire. It's going to be Uranus, Venus, Mercury. You know, Aries is war, right? And we're like creeping up on a new war. You know, we're screwing around in Yemen. Trump is continuing to do the drone strikes. He's thinking about sending people to Syria. So there's a lot happening on that front. Tomorrow could be very, very interesting. And we might actually see something that could be very provocative. Don't discount North Korea. Not because we're dealing with ninth house information, foreign governments, foreign countries. So what has Korea been doing? You know, missile porn. You know, they're shooting off these missiles. So I keep my eyes on North Korea tomorrow and the relationship with uh, the U.S. and North Korea. But that, that, all that Pisces, it's like it's cowering over in the eighth house. You know, oh, no, we're not ready to get involved here. I mean, those planets are all basically unaspected except with each other. And they're hidden. They're tucked away. And when in the eighth house, all that Pisces in the eighth house yeah. tends to be very culty and occulty in a lot of ways. So there's something going on there that is kind of out of the way. You know, not a lot of people, there's not a lot of contact. There's not a lot of celestial contact. So tomorrow should be an interesting day based on sort of the historical nature of what we've gone through and what's happened on the eyes of March, March 15th. And, you know, these aspects sometimes – they take a day or two. Like we might see something go off on Friday, you know, and not, and not tomorrow. So, you know, I would say, you know, you know, keep your high beams on between tomorrow and most likely Sunday. Yeah. So how far out, how far out are we projecting now to be in this particular mode? Um, commencing tomorrow and going forward. And, and is, well, this, is this got a trajectory that's going to reverberate out into some other yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're. I mean, we've been dealing with reverberations from Pluto Uranus yeah. square for the last, you know, four years, five years. I mean, these things are like waves, and they continue to kind of, you know, cascade. And and um, so, you, you know, we'll, especially with the Uranus Jupiter opposition, because that's like live. That's like right now. You know, Jupiter. We can talk a little bit about this um, from a personal level. You know, Jupiter expands everything, right? That's the nature of Jupiter. Blows it up. Sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's just excessive, right? It's not always really, really good. In Libra, it's blowing up the this potential for balance and harmony and symmetry and uh, to some degree peace, uh, synergy. But the the other thing that that Libra tends to do is, of all the signs, Libra compromises more than anything. More than any other sign, they're given a compromise. So what Jupiter in Libra is doing is ex it's expanding all those kind of Libra and qualities, including compromise, and it's going backwards. So I think what we're involved in right now is we're all kind of looking at, you know, where, where, where did I compromise? Where did I give things up? You know, where did I let people take advantage of me? You know, where did I put somebody first when I should have put myself first? And that's concurrent with this Venus and Aries retrograde. Aries is all about the self. And Venus is about relationship. And it's going backwards, too. So a lot of this stuff that's happening is about us, right? Like, you know, I'm getting back into shape. I'm trying to get my body back together. And I'm looking, you know, where did I, you know, give my power away? Where did I choose somebody else for whatever it was? Yeah. Gratification, ego gratification, sex, whatever. This is a time now where we get to look at that stuff and rebalance it because when it moves forward, you know, we're moving ahead. All these cycles now are about our evolutionary process. You know, we are, we are on a bullet train now to, to, you know, explode this whole thing and come into this 
new level of humanity and divinity and really syncing up with something that, you know, for a long time has been denied. And part of it is the programming, the <laughs> chemicals, the chemtrails, the political parties, the divide and conquer. It's all concressing. And as it's concressing, we're in this dynamic where we're sorting things out and hopefully getting straight, getting clear, getting right. So when there's this intersection in time that, that when, when the collapse hits and there will be some kind of a collapse, it will, I don't think it's going to be like catastrophic, but there's going to be enough to kind of hang on to for a while, but there will be some kind of a collapse. And at that point, we're going to need to be ready to move because when that happens, there's going to be kind of a, a chaotic moment in space time and we can occupy that space time if we're ready and if we've done our work and now's the time to do it. So this is a very interesting time in a lot of ways. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people right now prognosticating and it feels to me, I've seen a lot of renewed interest right now in Bitcoin blockchain and other types of digital currencies as a renewed interest and renewed activity. And some of this is just pure commerce. On the other side of it, what I see is even my own interest right now is in terms of, of, of the financial system of finding safe haven for things, whether it's gold, silver, Bitcoin, or, or some other kind of digital currency. Is this kind of the forebodings, the shadows of what we think we're looking at? Because some people think this economic collapse is like slated for like now, tomorrow. I mean, a lot of, yeah. I heard a lot of people fixing a lot on this Ides of March vestibule that we're in right now in this respect. Yeah. The Sean from SGT report had a video out the other day that was called, what does the Rothschild, what do the Rothschild bank know about uh, March 15th? And so there is a lot of people who are thinking that there's going to be some kind of economic kind of collapse I, I, tomorrow. Robert, I agree with you that I don't think there's going to be a major collapse, but I think that like this, there are some people who are going to, who aren't prepared, people who are just uh, hypersensitive right now, who might take it that way and can overreact. But actually, like, I feel like this time it's really important for us to use this time when things are very chaotic and divisive. The, I mean, friend and I have been talking a lot about this. We need to use this time to learn a new way to talk to each other, to learn a new way to communicate so that we can't be sent to level 10 crazy when, when shit hits the fan. If, yeah. everybody just is, if, if, if there's a, especially a strong group of us that are really able to hold center, but also to really to help be able to facilitate dialogue between those having a little bit of a harder time holding their center, then whatever kind of benefits that chaos has always provided the establishment, it's not going to work this time. And I think that's really something important to focus on is really finding new and better ways to communicate with each other and not, um, not allow ourselves to get, get, get pulled into that um, divisive, picking sides kind of stuff that for some people seems to be really satisfying. God, it's, so, it's so easy to get drawn in. It is yeah. so easy to get drawn yeah. in. Brandy and I actually talked about this a little bit when we, uh, when he was on my show a couple yeah, of really good. I listened. Yeah, it was really good. And, and, you know, we, I, I brought up this notion of, you know, having new emotional presets and because, you know, the emotional presets that we had prior to Trump getting elected, they're just not going to work anymore. They're yeah. just not. I mean, we're in a whole different kind of psychic and uh, emotional terrain. And I, I, I tend to think, uh, and this is just me, but I tend to think, that we've got to be really in the moment. We've got to be really in the now. We've got to be re we're ready to pivot at any point in time. We've got to be ready to call bullshit on people if we have to. We've got to be ready to rip our hearts open and, and love somebody if we need to. I mean, this is what I think is being asked of us at this point in time. And to get to that place, man, you've got to tear stuff down. And you've got to really look at yourself and see, you know, where the blocks are, you know, where you've got hidden anger, which for a lot of people is a big issue. Yeah. It's this kind of anger that they've held on to for a long time. And a lot of people are really afraid to get angry. Like maybe this Venus retrograde in Aries might help out with that. Because once you get through that anger, once you tap into that, you know, what's beneath all that is just pure grief. You know, and I think we're just sitting on, you know, it's, a, it's a really bad time to be passive aggressive, isn't it? I don't think you That's can get what I'm seeing right yeah. now. 
Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think that's going to work anymore. No, I, I don't also, either. I think there's a lot of people holding on to a lot of uh, old anger and whatever from their personal life, and these kinds of yeah. um, uh, things that the establishment provides people to get outraged about these kinds of political things, the racism, the this and that, they're fueling the energy that, that might not even have anything, to, that doesn't affect them in any way. It doesn't even make sense why they're so concerned about it. But the rage that they have for something personal in their life, it, it gets directed. There's a lot of triangulation and a lot of yeah. deflection going on right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you know who's the poster child for this? Ashley Judd. Oh, Ashley, Ashley Judd, Judd, totally, yeah. If you look at Ashley Judd's chart, yeah. she's got like five or six planets in Aries. Yeah. They're all buried in her eighth house. And she's got Chiron in Aries, Saturn in Aries. I mean, this, I mean, she talks about being violated and abused. I mean, she talked about that. Yeah. There were men that didn't do anything. And I can look at her chart and I completely agree. It happened. Yeah. Right? It went on in her chart. And so she had a career and, you know, ma managed and handled. And here comes Donald Trump. And what does Trump do? Totally triggers yeah. everything in her eighth house. Yep. So her personal issues get blown up and exploded. And because she is a public figure. Trump seems to do, you know, Trump feels to me, and I've seen this with people he seems to catalyze something in people that's very deep and very visceral. Yes. He, he almost yeah. elicits an emotional response that's it's out of bounds with what is normal for a public figure or somebody that you don't know personally. It seems like people take this shit personally with Trump. So personal. It is so yeah. personal. Yeah. It's amazing, yeah. huh? Yeah, I, it, it is crazy how triggered so many people are by this man. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think he, I don't, you know me, I don't, don't believe, I don't like the whole thing. I don't like any of the politics. And I don't think that we should have government and whatnot. But I don't find, I certainly don't find, I mean, he, 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 he sure, he can says offensive stuff, but I just look at it like kind of ridiculous and stupid. You know what I mean? Like, I don't understand, like, how this could be something that people take to heart and get all like, you know, their fucking pants in a wad about. Yeah, you know, but but they do, you know, and I can, you know, I personally find well, it's, it's 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 the repressed issues. I mean, my theory yeah. of Trump is that you know, and, and I may get a lot of you know flame or hate mail. It's okay, whatever. But my theory on Trump is for a lot of the millennials, he's the father that wasn't there. Yeah, you know, he comes yeah. across as the dad that wasn't there. They're pissed off at him. You know, there's a lot of derision. Yeah. A lot of well, resentment. basically, you know, if you look at this. We, we went from Obama, who was almost like the Peter Pan of presidents. He was like the president that never grew up. Well, Obama's, Obama was the guy you're, the, that their mom dated on the weekend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and maybe he, their he, dad. He cool. <laughs> they listened to hip hop, you know, and... Like, took him to the basketball game, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. then, oh, I love this guy, you know, but, they, yeah. he, but you know, he's not there. He's not there to, like, do the, the heavy lifting. Yeah. You know, but he's cool. You know, I can relate to that. So you're totally right. He's like the, the Peter Pan and the, and the weekend boyfriend that came in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, I just, it, there's so many po other politicians that have said and done things that I find so much more offensive than anything Trump has said or done, but people seem to be tolerate that and get just completely out of their minds, like crazy about stuff that he says that is just ridiculous and stupid. He's a trigger. He's a big yeah. time trigger. And Ashley Judd, I think, is, you know, the totally trigger for it. You know? Yeah, she she clearly didn't get fair trigger warning, right? <laughs> no, but it's it, and it's unfortunate because obviously yeah. this is very personal for her. Totally, yeah. You know, and she's bringing it out into the public. I actually feel very sorry for her. I have a lot of I have a lot of empathy for her. Yeah. No, I I I I actually always liked Ashley Judd and it is it is, I do feel bad for her watching her sort of implode in front, in front of everybody like this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. So we, we've hit on the Mar uh, Ides of March and Venus retrograde. So said you had some interesting things you wanted to talk about related to Mike Pence and to Jared Kushner. So yeah, Mike Pence's chart. You know, I just, mm. you know, what an odd chart. Talk of him taking over has been, been coming up a lot again lately. What's that? Talk of him, this idea of getting rid of, you know, getting rid of Trump, which may have always been the idea so that Pence could be president. I've been seeing a lot of chatter and articles about that kind of thing again, which I hadn't seen in a couple months. Uh, yes. So 
apparently there's some plan now that's cooking that tr- that Pence is working with Hillary Clinton. Have you heard this? Yeah, I've heard. I mean, I haven't heard that cl- that straightforward of a theory, but I've heard stuff that sounds like it's heading that way. Yeah. Yeah. So let me this. So let me. Uh, what's interesting about Mike Pence's chart? He now he's a Gemini, and he of was course. born on the seventh of June, nineteen fifty nine. So he's kind of, you know, one of our contemporaries, unlike Trump, who is not really contemporary. He comes from a different generation, different mindsets. Um, Pence is actually closer to Obama in terms of yeah, generation. Yeah. Uh, but you look at him and you say, well, that how can that be? I mean, he looks like he's, you know, much older than that. Yeah, he really carries does. himself in a weirdly kind of Christian conservative but semi-fake way. But if you look at his chart, it's almost like the same configuration as the Ides of March. Uh, and and I'm looking, I don't have his birth time, so I'm looking at kind of an Aries rising chart. I don't but have his chart here. Oh, I'd throw it up as a screen share. Where is uh, there's, You can go to astro, astrotheme.com if you can find astrotheme.com and just type in Mike Pence and you'll be able to see it. It comes up pretty quickly. But it's still that kind of like that kind of bowl oriented um, chart, uh, real close to a bowl chart. So there's a lot of development that's not occupied. But the thing that's really so he's a Gemini like Trump, and he's got Sun Mercury conjunction in Gemini. Now Trump does not have Mercury in Gemini. He's got Mercury in Cancer. He's got Venus in Cancer. He's got Saturn in Cancer. He's much more empathic and to some degree much more emotional than than, uh, Mike Pence is. Mike Pence has water in his chart, but it's it's you know it's in Scorpio. It's like it's like deep water. It's water that's got at times, you know, this sort of maybe a a hidden agenda or something else going on. Like is it like the viscous like that viscous liquid you get deep in the ocean that's kind of slimy and and sort of well, you know, I don't, I don't want to badmouth Scorpio people or Scorpio right. in general because I actually like Scorpio, but it's a sign of all the signs. Scorpio is the one sign that is the most connected to power. Like yeah. Scorpio loves power, and again, you know, astrology one on one. What does Jupiter do? Jupiter expands yeah. Yeah. whatever it's in. So if Mike Pence has Jupiter and Scorpio, it's expanding his need for power, right? Now, he also has Jupiter retrograde, so that's tricky in and of itself right? with, a, with a Jupiter retrograde motion because not it's, it's almost like he's, how do I say this? It's almost like he's reanimating lessons and principles about power from another point in time, maybe from another incarnation. So he's like picking things up and he's, you know, going, kind of reaching back into his psychic and maybe even a cult toolkit, right? Like I would, I would not be surprised if Pence is a Freemason. Uh, I don't have any information on that. What do you know? Like, you know, this is a guy who in his early life was a gay man who was reprogrammed under uh, a Christian, um, there's a Christian program out there. You can see it in his chart. Yeah, you can see this weird sexuality in this chart. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a. I wasn't aware of this. It's banned. He's Randy. a reprogrammed gay man. Well, I, I wasn't aware that he had this past. Yep. Well, if you look at his chart, he's yeah. got Venus, Mars, Randy. If you scroll that up, we'll be able to see his chart. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. So if you look at where Leo is. He, now, this is where it's weird, right? Because Leo represents kids, right? Remember that. Leo's over yeah, here. Venus right. at zero degrees, Leo. So he's got a very strong relationship with children. He's got Mars and Leo, three degrees, Venus-Mars conjunction. And then he's got that um, Uranus in Leo, uh, which is not conjunct Mars, but it's kind of, you know, in the same, it's in the same neighborhood. So, so to this, me, this represents a very kind of confused sexuality in a lot of uh, ways. Because you have this blending of the masculine and the feminine 
yeah. which is really, really, really close, right? Like, you know, maybe he could go either way. Maybe, you know, maybe, I mean, if you're looking at reprogramming with yeah. Uranus thrown in the mix. Well, and this is, I mean, this, yeah. is, this is very controversial. I'm somewhat familiar with this program because of the fact that I worked in Christian counseling in another incarnation of my life. This is really controversial stuff because it actually is a form of mind control where they take and divide the consciousness, the, the personality of the person to demonize the inclinations of homosexuality. And so in a lot of ways, this guy has gone through a program that has altered him in a way that he's now alienated from that aspect of himself. You can argue people were born gay, whatever, but that was an aspect he expressed early in life. So we would consider that to be a dominant personality trait. And that has been severed off of him to make him acceptable to the evangelical yeah. community. Well, completely walled off that part of yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all, all that strangeness is in Leo, and it's like that's the sign of children. Can I, with this strong relation, strong relationship with children, would it lean more towards uh, he's going to protect children, or more towards he's a pedophile? Oh, I think it's the latter. Yeah, Goes okay. either way. Yeah, it's it's actually, go either way. But because yeah. because if you look at where Neptune is in his chart, again Scorpio, again retrograde, it's squaring Venus and it's squaring Mars, and anytime you get into a Mars square to Neptune. Venus square to Neptune, any any of the inner planets when they square Neptune, there's deception. There's a level of deception, and what you know, what people see isn't always what they get. Yeah. Um, so you know when we get into Mars, like Mars is sexuality. Yeah. And when we get into Mars Neptune square sexuality. Yeah. You confused with the Mars Neptune square. And it's a male not, expression, right? The male expression yeah, of the sexual. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, this chart indicates that he's got some really strange stuff. Yeah, well, he's just, just he's just, Mars. It's very, you know, very and, unusual. You know, I got to drop how this. Did you, how did you know this stuff about him, Randy? This just came up in research that I did around the time that he was selected. I started to look okay. at him more carefully. There's okay. another aspect to this that I think we have to consider. Um, it's long sat in the back of my mind that because Pence, would, Pence was not in the circle of the Trump camp, he was not somebody who was in the orbit ever, ever in the history of Trump. So sure. he, was, he was saddled with this guy like, um, like Kennedy was saddled with Johnson, Reagan was saddled with Bush. Yeah. They, they put a, a guy in there, and the guy is either the actual – calling the shots leader or he is the ringer or he is the guy they're going to drop in in the event the, that the, the principal yeah. needs to be replaced and i think we all get the drift of what that means i think trump, I, I think trump needs to get rid of him i do too you yeah i think I he's a problem why. you look at where his pluto is it's at one degree virgo it's right on trump's ascendant his pluto is right on trump's ascendant and pluto of course is death and transformation it's a very heavy energy really really heavy energy i mean that that is to me that is one of the most inauspicious places for anybody's pluto to be sitting in proximity to trump now, does this point to something traitorous perhaps well or... pluto i mean pluto's really dominant in a chart okay. so when, when it's sitting on trump's ascendant which is like his point of contact with the world, how people see him, uh, how he evolves over the course of his lifetime, that Pluto dominates him. That Pluto, it's like, it's like goes in over the top of his personality. And uh, I would say that, I mean, I think Trump is a strong personality to, to some degree. I think in other ways he's very weak. But... Um, but this Pluto, it comes right in over the top and will dominate him. And to the degree that, you know, Pluto also represents sex, right? I mean, it's the planet that is that we associate with, with sexuality and depth and the underworld and all those things that we consider to be, quote, unquote, taboo. And that's right on his ascendant. And I, 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 think, I think he's got it. I mean, if Trump wants to finish his term and get through, Mike Pence has to go. 
That's what I see here. Now, the other thing that's interesting is he's got his moon in Gemini at 29 degrees, which is anoretic. It's right at that final degree in Gemini. Like it wants to go to Pisces, oh, Cancer. It wants to be empathic. You know, it wants to feel, but it's in this kind of um, kind of strange place with the conjunction with Mercury. And so he's intuitive. Mike Pence, anytime you get into a, a Mercury moon conjunction, he has intuition. He's got some psychic gifts, this guy. So don't underestimate him at all. And he's got a, a, a sextile uh, with um, uh, Pluto to the moon. And so he's, you know, he's very into power. But this, this Gemini moon is, you know, it's, it's wobbly. It's right at this, this point where it's, it's dual. It's back and forth. And I don't think anybody really knows who this guy is in a lot of ways. Yeah, no. You really yeah. don't. And what's it's fascinating is that Trump, Trump also um, has his moon, uh, but it's in, it, it's, well, Trump's moon is in Sagittarius. So, you know, we've got opposite moons, right? So Pence has the full moon, he has a new moon in Gemini, and Trump has a full moon in Sagittarius. There's something strangely alchemical about them, you know, that they kind of complete each other in a weird kind of way. Like, I don't know if you saw this, but when it was like right after when Trump got elected, he brought a lot of the military guys and James Comey, and, and he was thanking him. And they brought this one guy up. I don't, I don't remember who he was. But Trump and um, Pence greeted him simultaneously. And it was almost like they were doing like this NLP Harry Carey on the dude. Mm, it was weird. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was like Trump was touching him at one point and Pence was touching him too. You know, when you get into that touching thing, people kind of go like this, right? And then they insert the program. It's, a, it's you know, it's yeah. a, kind of a key piece of NLP. They were doing like this dual trip on him. And it was like, wow, I mean, they're both Geminis, you know, and, and, they, and they've got this weird kind of thing with each other's moons kind of reflecting. I don't, I, in some ways, it, it, it almost feels like they've done this before on some level, someplace else, you know, and, but I think this time yeah. there's got to be a different outcome. I just would not trust that Pluto on Trump's ascendant. Mm. You think with this kind of what we just discussed about he being, you know, programmed to wall off the gay thing, do you think that, because people don't think of it so much with the vice president, but do you think he could be a Manchurian candidate kind of, kind of thing? Well, it, completely a problem. That, quite possibly. I mean, I, I think the guy's utterly robotic. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, I think he's it's, utterly it's, robotic. I mean, he's, you know, he's. No emotion whatsoever. Nothing. There's, there's no, there's nothing. There's nobody home. You know what I mean? Like, there's no. He's obviously calculating in the things that he does. But like, I can't. I don't know. I mean, I know he's vice president, and I know a few things about him. But he's like utterly uncompelling in terms of like, oh, this person's interesting. I want to take a look at him. Like, he's just utterly. It is completely robotic. He's there, sort of. You know, it, it is weird. Like, so I, he's cold. You know, he's, he's got cold. that moon Saturn opposition too, which is really chilly. Really, really should. I mean, at least Trump has those cancer planets in his chart. He's got some empathy, you know, when he talks and he, he's really feeling himself and feeling the crowd, you know, he can really project into it and feel it. Pence has none of that, none of it. And I don't know if you guys followed this, but you probably have because you're both up on it. But one, there was this rumor that one of the reasons why Mike Flynn got kicked out was because he had dirt on Mike Pence's best friend. That was connected, yeah, that. To, connected to kids. Yeah, so. I, I, well, also in what you were talking about before about how, you know, possibly Mike Pence being secretly in bed with Hillary, you know what I mean? And there's, you know, that's, if he's in bed with Hillary, then that it, maybe his role is to protect the pedophiles, which isn't just Democrats. There are a lot, you know, there's lots of Republican pedophiles too. But, you know, that, I, I would imagine that uh, high on the agenda, if you're in bed with Hillary, is to protect the pedophilia racket. Right. Likely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's all kind of bound up, you know. So what's interesting, we can if you want to shift to Jared Kushner. Yeah. You want to talk about his chart? Yeah. He's a, and this is another interesting. I mean, how weird that this is a person who's, you know, a private citizen that has no political experience or any kind of 
any experience, and he's a major advisor to to Trump, and with all of these, and you know, very cur- you know, not, all of these connections and interests that should be a complete non-starter for people to accept sitting right next to the president. So, what do you think? Let's get into what's going on with him. Well, he, he just scored a four hundred million dollar deal today. <laughs> of course, he did. Of course, with, with the Chinese. Mm. Yeah. What's the, what, what kind of just the business standard business deal or what is this kind of it, 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 like some kind of insurance deal? Um, but you know, it, it, I mean, must be nice to sit that close to the president. Right. Uh, Andy, if you go to that same site, and, I've and already got like, Jared Kushner up here. Yeah, you can, you can, uh, I'm going to screen check. share this so that you, I, I don't think they have the time, but but there's a key aspect in this chart. Um, so I think Mike Pence had his Saturday Capricorn right around seven degrees, right around seven degrees. Um, the, 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 so what you had, so Kushner is a Capricorn. He's a 20 degrees Capricorn, Mercury and Capricorn, both he, he and Donald Trump and Ivanka, because he and Ivanka are, are born sort of close together. All three of them have Jupiter and Libra which is interesting, right? So they all, you know, would get along really, really, really well, right? Um, somebody just, you, yeah. weird, you, oh, that's you. That's not me. Okay. Um, so they actually bond quite well because they all have all three of them in Jupiter and Libra. But the, the aspect that is that really grabbed me when I saw his chart was that true node in Leo at 10 degrees. And and um, I, I and it and it resonated with me because Trump has Pluto in Leo, and he has it in the twelfth house, which is a very intense place for Leo. There's like a lot of like like there are things that Trump went through that none of us know about that I think were quite painful in a lot of ways um, because that's the nature of Pluto in the twelfth house. Almost every one of my clients that I've ever talked with who has Pluto in the 12th, has had either a father leave, a father die. Perhaps this was his brother that died due to alcoholism. Maybe it was something that happened when he was sent away to that uh, academy school. But he's, he's like sitting on some very deep and very private pain that that, that, that Pluto in the 12th house would indicate. Um, so it's a very intense place. But over time, you know, that's also kind of the meeting ground of dealing with really powerful people. And behind the scenes. Now, his Pluto, which is, of course, generational, happens to be at 10 degrees Leo. Jared Kushner's true note is right on Trump's Pluto. So the the true note... Sorry, the chart changed at some point, Randy. It looked different when you first put it on, and then some of the lines went away, and it looks kind of like not much, at least on my screen right now. Yeah, some of the aspects went away. Yeah. Um, But but there you go. go. The one... So... so, um, Kushner has what's called a bundle chart. Yeah, it's all, top, every, it's all up top, huh? It's, it's all up top, and it's really all between house 11 and house 7. So, you know, he's really, well, again, we don't have a birth, is this his birth time? Is this his birth time? Can you scroll down, Randy, just a little bit? This is not his birth time. So wherever it shows up, um, whatever his birth time would be, and I, and I, and I actually... He was actually, you know, you want to, they don't give a time. He was born January 10th, 1981. Yeah, so what I did on my site is I, 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 rectified, his chart. PM. I rectified his chart and I had him as a Gemini rising in his chart. But any wherever it shows up, that bundle is going to be real tight and he's really there to focus on whatever that those those houses are as it relates to the rising sign. But that true note, that thing that looks like a horseshoe, it's a really important part. It's the ascending plane of the moon. And in this lifetime, we're, you know, it's really helpful if we can align with it. That, that's our true north, right? So in this lifetime, he's supposed to take on Leonine lessons, leadership, rulership, children. He's got three of them, right? So he's here to develop a healthy ego. That's the nature of true note and Leo and get into some form of, of rulership. Now, that true note is right on Donald Trump's Pluto 
in his 12th house. So if you look at Jared Kushner's true node on Trump's Pluto and Pence's Pluto right on Trump's ascendance, these guys are really, in a lot of ways, controlling what's going on right now in the White House. And don't underestimate Jared Kushner's influence. Now, some people would say it's Trump's Pluto that's actually benefiting Kushner's true node. I think that that's true. But he's also asserting his will. He's also asserting his development and his evolution. It's like jacking in. He's like jacking into Trump's power. That's exactly what he's doing. So I think we're seeing two kind of models of, you know, sort of this, uh, this, this trinary presidency with Pence and Kushner and Trump. I think they're all, they're, they're all engaged right now in a very active way in terms of steering this thing. And I'm not sure all of them would even get along, to be honest with you. I'm not sure Kushner – well, you know, Kushner's got these Capricorn – planets. He's got Sun in Capricorn and Mercury Capricorn. And um, oh, this is really interesting. His Venus is at 29 degrees Sagittarius, and it's opposite uh, Pence's moon in Gemini at 29 degrees. They don't get along. I tell you right now, these guys don't get along. That was my Whatever. guess, too. And I yeah. actually see this is kind of a tug of war between yeah. two factions where you have the, the guy that's there as the, the inside guy you know, Pence, and then Jared Kushner is Trump's satellite kind of person because it's family. It's a, they're business aligned. They're similar proclivities in a, in a way in terms of money, power, and all of that. So you kind of have this, this, this back and forth pull, which really, it, to me, it kind of shows up right now in Trump where you scratch your head and you go, I wasn't sure he was going to do that, but it looks like, whoever is prevailing at the moment. Yeah, I think it's quite true. And, and when I look at Kushner's Saturn in Libra at nine degrees, it's in square with Pence's Saturn uh, in uh, Capricorn. And if you throw Trump's Saturn and Cancer in there, what we have is a T-square, all three of them. Although Trump's Saturn is, I think, at around 20 degrees, so it's kind of out of orb. But they're all occupying cardinal signs. Now, I think Kushner probably has some respect for Pence on some level because Pence has that Saturn and Capricorn and it's kind of authoritarian. I think he can kind of respect that on some level, but I can tell you these two are in conflict between the, the opposing, between the Saturns and square and the opposition between mood, the Kushner's uh, Venus in Sagittarius and Pence's um, mood in Gemini. There's conflict there. And I think probably if Trump had to lean on one of them, Kushner, it'd probably be better if he le if he leaned on Kushner. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, or I, th I think I think that would be his natural inclination anyway, if it were his choice to lean on Kushner. I don't I don't think Kushner is great either, but I feel like there's more. I don't feel like he's trying to manipulate Trump in quite the. Um, I think he doesn't have to manip manipulate Trump because they have more similar interests. Where I think Mike Pence is really trying to, you know get him to do something different than what he might do on his own. Well, I think there's, there's plenty of court intrigue here, you know, just yeah. between these three alone. And the more that I look at Kushner's chart, the more that I get a sense that he's got a, some more humanity than, yeah. than Mike Pence. You know, he's yeah. got Moon and Pisces, which is, you know, can be very compassionate and empathic. And that actually connects him with um, uh, Trump's Venus in, uh, in cancer. So they have a, They've got to try. And so there's, there's really some empathy between the two. And I, and I actually think he actually really likes Jared Kushner. I can, I can see this in the chart. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I would agree. has no earth in his chart. He has no earth. So he's not grounded at all. And you've got um, Kushner with Sun and Mercury uh, and Capricorn. And that's a lot more grounded than, than what Trump can bring to the table. But I think it, this is going to be interesting to see how this plays out between these three guys. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I agree. What do you, I mean, what is your, what about the other things about Kushner though? Obviously he has lots of connections and interest in Israel and all of that kind of jazz. What do you think about that? Like, what is, what do you, you know, we well, have to, I think it's more. idealistic. I mean, there, I, clearly there's, there's like a, a political advantage in some ways 
I mean, theoretically, you know, because Israel is, basically runs APAC and APAC is such a powerful lobby uh, in Washington. But I also think it's strangely sympathetic. I mean, he's got Venus and Sagittarius, which is dealing with, you know, relationships with other countries, other cultures. Right. Um, and then there's that conjunction with Neptune, which brings this kind of idealism. Like, I really... Like, I think this guy is inspired in some ways mm -hmm. by kind of the, the Zionist sort of, you know, moving into a new land and setting up a state and, you know, merging that state with a people and a cause and an identity. I think, he, I think he's really into it. Right. But, but, but right. no, I think, I think he's into it, too. But we can't. Well, what do I think? I mean, yeah, well, yeah. well, Pence is a Zionist too. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You have the hardcore Zionist. Yeah. But yeah. Hardcore. Evangelical hardcore. conservative with a, a very deep religious investment in Zionism. Yeah. I mean, when, when Trump announced that he was going to be his running mate, he announced it in Zionsville, Indiana. <laughs> of course, of course he did. <laughs> he, could, he could have announced it in any city in Indiana, but he, he chose. Zionsville. Zionsville. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, look, I think it's all problematic. I have a really, I have a really hard time with having dual citizens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. being a part of the government. Yeah. And I don't care what country they're from. Uh, no, I agree. Yeah. You know, they can be a dual citizen with England, which is, you know, sort of white and uptight. It's like, no, you know, this, no. this country Needs to have, try and be a dual well, citizen. You know, here we are. We're back in Arabia. Or, we're you know, we're back. Not gonna work. I'm sorry. And they don't even have a real government. But you know what I'm saying? Try yeah. try and be a dual citizen in Malaysia and be a part of their government. It's not going to happen. China. Yeah. It's not going to happen. We're kind of but, back to the Thirteenth Amendment, where had that stood, the original unexpurgated version of it, you would have gotten rid of titles of nobility the bar would not be operating and you would most certainly not have dual citizenship with anybody who is inside of a, of a legitimate government because of the conflicts of interest. When did that come on the books? The 13th amendment was enacted. I think I want to say around between 1799 and 1810. It was the reason why we fought the war of 1812, by the way. That was the bill that that's when they came in and they burned Washington because quite frankly, the British couldn't let that stand because that would have truncated the yeah. special arrangement yes. touted by Thatcher and Reagan back in the eighties and echoed by the Bushes, which links us to the monarchy, the city of London, because of that's where our tax payments go. And that's actually the overseer for the United States. And so then now by extension, the five eyes, which include is, includes Israel. So it's probably yeah. seen in a lot of ways as just an extension of that. Well, there's huge triangulation. Yeah, yeah. Even between, even between um, obviously, the Vatican as well. I mean, Vatican, yeah. London, Washington, D.C., Tel Aviv. You know, you've... Yeah. Um, I've, I've, done, I've done Trump's chart in relation to Israel's chart. And boy... It is like two peas in a pod, <laughs> really connected in a big way. So when he says how much he loves Israel, and I mean he's he he's not he's not BSing. He's not <laughs> yeah. He's not there to make a deal. The Thirteenth um, Amendment. Um, I just had it up here. It was uh, passed on January thirty first, eighteen sixty five. Yeah, that and, was the second version of it. There, that wasn't the original version. Yeah, and they repassed that, and then they did the Fourteenth Amendment, which is basically an annexation of the Organic Constitution. Those two acts together, along with the um, what Lincoln put through in terms of abolition, there was a whole series of. They were very busy after the Civil War. But that was basically all summed up in the 14th Amendment, which annexed the original organic constitution, retitled it as um, Constitution of the United States rather than the Constitution for the United oh. States with the, cat, with the small U. So there was, that's an interesting period of time. I would love to see that broken down astrologically. 
Well, because I'm the U.S. went get... under corporate reorganization at that point. Yeah, I was trying to get a trying to get a handle on it because um, there's a lot of different dates. Yeah, there are, and the history is not clear on it because the the War of eighteen twelve really wiped a lot of that out. I mean, again, you want to wipe records clean, Oklahoma City, um, that little thing called 9-11. You know, they do traumatic events to just wipe out and blot out an entire historical period. That's true. Yeah. So it says here that the Senate passed the amendment on April 8th, 1864. Does that sound right to you, Randy? That sounds right in terms of them passing what they call the 13th Amendment, but there was an earlier version of that. Are we talking about the 13th or the 14th right now? 13th. Okay. 13th, yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take a crack at this. It says ratified amendment 1865, yeah. ratified amendment post-enactment 1865-1870, ratified amendment after first rejecting amendment 18... 18- 66 to 1995. And maybe I'm, I don't know. I mean, I've studied this period before. There's listeners and viewers out there who will, I'm sure, correct us as well. But I'm aware of a 13th Amendment that predated the War of 1812. It says, it says the 13th Amendment became part of the Constitution on December 6, 1865. Okay. Following the ratifications of various states, all of which took place mostly in February. So that's a Sagittarian amendment. I'll, I'd, I'll have to look at that astrologically. That would yeah, be I'll have to go back and dig into my research on the original 13th Amendment because there was at one time a 13th Amendment that would have taken titles and nobility out, which would have taken down the bar, the barristers. It would have removed the Freemasons as well because of the oaths to the lodge. And it would also, you know, obviously... Uh, vitiated any dual citizenship by leaders. Well, I will, I will take a crack at this and see what I can come up with. You know, I looked at the Patriot Act, you know, which, you know, (laughs) know, just basically demolished the constitution. Yeah, it did. And the the great thing about the, 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 the constitution and the declaration of independence is that the declaration of independence makes us a cancerian country. And as a cancer, cancer is not a, it's not an aggressive sign. Like cancer retreats and cancer will defend and cancer will um, respond, especially if it's children or family or homeland is threatened. So that whole notion of not going to war unless we were provoked yeah. was very much in alignment. Well, with everything that. that came after that 1865, 1866 period and going right up into the late 1800s, into the 20th century, where we stepped across the Rubicon was the Spanish-American War. That was our first war of foreign intrigue, and we never looked back after that. We haven't had a single justifier. Well, that would be by the way, in 1865, with um, the ratification in Sagittarius, which sets us up with foreign countries, uh, which is very Sagittarian. And that... That actually brings us into an interesting juncture here because of what you're writing about in your, in your current article on your website. And you might want to just let people know where your website is and, and what they can find there. Why well, fumble to find the damned article again. Here we go. Um, tell them about your website, Robert. So it's robertphoenix.com. And, um, you know, I, ha- I have this latest piece up there, but I also have – you know, over 900 posts on my website. And if you could, you know, get in there and play around, you can find material just about anything. Like I, I broke down the Schofield Bible astrologically. I've got I, every, just about everything we've talked about tonight, except for this ratification of the 13th Amendment. And this is contested, by the way, until we get some clarity on it. I may have just spoken out of, out of turn on this, but I'm pretty sure my, re, my memory and my research tells me this predates that particular enactment. Well, I just wanted to, to, to finish off this thing with the Patriot Act, which yeah. is, it's a, it's a Virgoan document. You know, unlike the Declaration, Declaration of Independence, which is Cancerian. And, and so with the Virgoan document and this whole notion of preemptive strike, you know, being mutable, 
uh, and you know, Virgo is very nervous. It's a nervous sign. It's peripatetic. So everything that's happened since 9-11, 2001, is really indicative of this kind of Virgoan sort of shift that we've, Virgo is not necessarily aggressive per se, but it, it, unlike cancer, which is defensive, Virgo can be a bit offensive. You know, if it feels like it's threatened, it will, it will jump out. It will be, it can be kind of sharp and cutting and nasty, but it doesn't go in all the way. You know, that's the nature of Virgo. It's a mutable sign. And look at these wars we're in. They're not even like real wars. No, yeah. th- 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 these are just where we're at now is expansion of an empire, but it's not in the interest of the government body proper. It is in the interest of corporatocracy. Yeah. You know, and I think you have to look more closely for that to 1947 again. Look at the National Security Act and what that brought into play, including the CIA, the National Security Council, and a whole bevy of federal agencies that became empowered overnight. And they did it while putting everything behind uh, a steel wall of, of secrecy. Absolutely. And where I was going to go with this, if I can kind of pull this back as it jumped into my head, uh, in, in, in the current article, Ret- Mer- Venus Retrograde, broad, with, where, where we were pulling this material earlier, you talk about um, Pluto hitting 27 degrees in February of 2022, which basically augurs the end of the United States as we know it. It looks like right now that's a target date for a tra- for a major shift. So with that major shift, can we go back and riff through history and maybe find where we had these other insertions of power structure in the United States? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the big one is 11-22-1963, you know, where where we have this major coup and the CIA takes over, and the deep state really starts running everything in a big yeah, way. Absolutely. That, that's a major point in time. And, I mean, that's congruent with a, a lot of other sort of social movements that are all kind of roiling under Saturn and Aquarius, and it moves into um, uh, Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society and the War on Poverty and, you know, the welfare. I mean, that's a major point in time and that really pivots off of that 1122 day and the trauma and the ritual death of Kennedy and you know all that stuff you know because we're it's at that kind of end of Scorpio the beginning of Sagittarius a kind of liminal place but there are other points in times you know there you, um, you know Steve Bannon talks about the fourth turning Jay Widener has talked about the fourth turning and apparently we're in that next phase of the fourth turning right now uh, which makes a lot of sense, but this Pluto and Capricorn time, you know, there are two, there are two kind of major moments that we need to pay attention to. One is this eclipse that's coming on the 21st of August, which happens right on Trump's ascendant. And this eclipse is a full solar eclipse and it happens all across America. Like it's been titled the American eclipse. What was the date on this? 21st of August. Okay. And that puts it right at 28 degrees Leo, puts it right on Trump's ascendant. That is a shadowy time. That is a really, really shadowy time, and potentially for Trump and for the country in general. So everybody in the astrological community has got that date pinned on their calendar. And how that's going to unfold, you know, we, you know, it'll be interesting because the other side of that eclipse, right, the other side of 27 Leo or 28 Leo is 28 Aquarius. And that's the masses. Those are the people. And it'll be very interesting to see. I mean, we're all going to, you know, theoretically live through that and get to witness that. I don't think there's been a a major solar eclipse across this country in a long time like this. So this is a big one. The other big movement is going to be when Uranus goes into the sign of Taurus, which is roughly about a year and a half from now. And that's when the money's going to change. That's when we're going to have kind of major, you know, um, disturbance around currency. Something could be actually quite good. 
I was listening to Cliff High again the other night. Yeah, and, I've, I've been listening to him a lot lately. Yeah, too. yeah. And, you know, it seems like he's back. You know, yeah. he was he was he was out there. For, I know. I mean, I think he had a lot of stuff going on with his wife and his mother in law. They're both really sick. Um, and he's back now. He's lucid. He's clear. He had a lot of really interesting things to say about gold and silver and Bitcoin. I could really see that dovetailing with this Uranus and Taurus time because Taurus is all about money and assets and metals and Uranus doing this interesting pivot with all of that. Um, and then the other date is what I brought up here, which is um, uh, that date when Pluto goes into Aquarius. Like, well, not Aquarius, but it's 27 degrees Capricorn. And I feel like everybody says well, that'll be the end of America. And I think it'll be the end of America kind of as we know it. But there'll be something interesting that will take place out of that time. I just wanted to ask you, and I unfortunately I haven't read that article, but what first came to my mind when Randy said that was, do you think that could be the point where the – we, we we start moving towards a more stateless society in terms of uh, we, we divest from the federal government where things go back to maybe more uh, smaller, you know, state government kind of thing, or even maybe when, when people, you know, I know also people have different ideas about this, but there's a lot of people who are moving towards this idea that government is the problem and that government in, inherently by its nature is on in a certain way illegitimate. You know what I mean? Is, could this be a time where, you know, people could really take power back, certainly to a more local level, but also to a more personal level, as opposed to continuing to look for authority outside of themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because what, whatever has existed between this arc of Pluto and whatever, because when you get into Pluto, I mean, there, it's, it's about endings, right? Pluto, there's no kind of gray, liminal, transitional phase with Pluto when it hits those exact degrees and you don't make deals with Pluto. You know, you just got, you just have to deal with whatever needs to die. So, so I mean, obviously what we're dealing with is something quite diseased anyway. Yeah. I mean, look at what's going on. These revelations, whether or not you believe Julian Assange or Edward Snowden are real or whatever, it's a glimpse into a very diseased um, kind of beast. Yeah. I don't think it's going to get better. I, I don't. Although there could be some interesting things that kind of supplement it, and we might take whatever those supplements are and bring them through to the other side. Right. And keep what's good and just, you know, and just, you know, take whatever is bad and take it out back and, you know, put it out of its misery. Yeah. You know, I, and, I, and that's not that far off. So do you think what I was talking about earlier about using this time that we're in right now to really start – facilitating a way of having dialogue with each other, civil dialogue, even with people that you disagree with, because obviously what's going on with the establishment politically is not in anyone's interest. So start working on that now. So when that moment comes in 2022, where maybe we have a chance to really push aside a system that no longer works for us, we're ready to be able to deal with each other so we don't have to have this outside authority to rule over us. Well, I don't think you can really talk to some of these people. I agree with you about that. <laughs> I, 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 I think that most of them, <laughs> and mostly on the left, yeah, I, mean, no. I think on the right, you can get people who will sit there and go, well, maybe, you know, I might have a predisposition. Let me think about that. Um, but I think on the left, there is just this vehement kind of um, denial. I, I, think, I think for the most part, you're right. But I have... I have been noticing, I've been watching a little bit more the chat. I have a few, I have a, particularly one good friend who comes more from the left, but has, is cooled in all of the information that we're, that we're schooled on. And she has for a long time now seen the, the error in the ways of the left. And, but I pay attention to her threads and what her people, because most of her friends are from the left, what they're saying. And there are a few people um, that are starting to come around and open themselves. There's not a lot. There's a few that are showing some potential for may, maybe for that. And so maybe what we need to do is just find who those, those few are because they are important and start sort of having dialogue with them. And then the people who aren't going to get it, let's, we can push them aside with the state and go, okay, you guys go over there and do that. We're building some sort of parallel system. We're going to do this. You do that. Maybe you'll realize ours work better and eventually join us. But for now, you stay over there and we'll go over here. 
Well, I really think that we're going to kind of split into separate worlds and separate yeah. teams. Yeah, that's what you I think. Know, yeah. I, I just, I, I think we're already there. And the only thing that you, that could change that is, you know, if there's some form of triangulation, we, you know, we're fighting giants from Antarctica or the fake aliens or whatever that is. So we all pull together the Chinese. That's the only way we can have any kind of, you know, um, kind of hegemony. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, really, I think the dialogue just has to start inside of yourself. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and, and to be able to be okay with this, you know, bicameralization and just leap yeah. back and forth. You know, we've got to be able to leap back and forth and frontwards yeah. and backwards and up and down. I mean, we've got to be mobile in all of our faculties, in all of our senses, in all of our emotions, in all of our thoughts. And we've yeah. got to be able to go fast and process yeah. really quickly and say, for me, not for me. And yeah. if it's not for you, why? And you yeah. can make this, do I need to look at that? Okay, maybe I need to look at it a little bit more. Okay, I'll take some of that and I'll bring that in. I'll say, you know what, I might have been wrong here or I might have jumped the gun here, right? Yeah. Uh, or like, no, I really know this internally and I trust myself enough to know this and I'm just going to go with this. And we, we don't have time for really equivocation but yeah. i think there's a difference between informed um you know unequivocation mm -hmm. and just like you know blocked off yeah like, well, this is no there's no yeah i mean this is just my it's who i am these are my principles yeah. you know good luck with that well, I think I, I think I think what you're saying is important that inner dialogue, but also just within yourself, working on eliminating the the inconsistencies and the contradictions in sort of yeah. your argument or your whatever you think is right. So work on narrowing the gap between your words and your actions. Pull yeah. that into alignment. If there is cognitive dissonance in the world, if there is cog and we we are swimming in cognitive dissonance, yeah. eliminate it inside of yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's it's, the key. Yeah, for sure. I, I find, it, I mean, I, that's something I've been working on a lot for the last, you know, couple of years. And the, the better I get at doing it within myself, the easier it is to do it than with other people, especially if they too have been working on, on that part of themselves. Yeah, and you can get two people that, you know, that are real, they're connected, and they may not see eye to eye, but man, you know, there's, there's ground there for yeah. something. Yeah, we don't, we, don't, we don't have to see eye to eye. We have, we just, we have to... Uh, act with integrity in terms of making our actions match our words and be willing to look as honestly and critically at ourselves as we are at other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think out of that, maybe we can start to have some kind of, some kind of dialogue. I don't think now is the time to talk. I really don't. A lot of people are just, they're not, they're not willing to hear it. I, I read a statistic where like the communist party got, went up 30, 30% or something yeah, like that. It's with, really bad. Yeah. With, um, membership, right. That gives you a sense and a clue as to where people are, you know, they're, they're looking for some kind of organization or group that's going to represent them. Well, and the fact that they're looking inside of a structure is probably the biggest flaw the biggest right problem. now. Yeah. They're, well, they're I'm looking, I totally agree. You yeah. know, you're, you're going to go back 150 years and you're going to begin to redeploy Marxism, which is never, it worked on one level, but it had to be radicalized in order to be viable politically. So uh, what I've been telling people for a long time, I mean, obviously, you know, it's about the inner game, but it's also about decentralizing and pulling away from the body politic, which wants to regulate you into a belief structure and a political system, yeah. it's, which it's goes really back to what religion. Emily was saying in terms of decentralizing or regionalizing or localization of government. Um, ultimately, you know, Bill Clinton said it with his tongue planted in his mouth, but it was true. All politics is local. And on one level, that's true. And I think as we see the financial power of this federal government spiral down to the point where federal programs are no longer funded, where revenue sharing with the state starts to drop off precipitously, you're going to see a pull back from the federal government. And you're going to see very economically um, pressed state legislatures going, wait a minute, what are we doing here? We've signed all of this over. We have all of these adhesion contracts we've made with the feds. They've taken our land. They've taken our rights. They've militarized our police. What's left? Maybe it's time to pull back, but it's going to be a oh, gradual I, I totally process. Agree. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at the opposition 
or the 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 the, you know, the sign that's opposite Capricorn. It's Cancer. It's Cancer, and so we've already gone through the the Pluto Sun opposition. So Pluto already went over. This was last year. The opposition to our Cancerian Sun as a as a country, and there was a major shift. There was a major shift. I mean, we went from basically eight years of Obama and identity politics to you know people saying I've had enough. You know, that was, in a lot of ways, it was activating this Cancerian kind of model. It, well, the model goes deeper. Cancer is very local. You know, in terms of astrology, it's the first sign we encounter water. You know, it's our home, it's our mother, it's our gardens, it's all those things. And in opposition to Capricorn, which is the corporatocracy, Pluto and Capricorn is the rise of corporatocracy. So if there's going to be something along those lines, which both I think you and Emily are talking about, it's got to have a Cancerian look and feel. You know, I, 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 I've been watching this show, The Chef's Table, Chef's Table on Netflix, and there's this really interesting one on this guy from Russia. He was a cook in Russia, a chef in Russia. And he details this story where, and I didn't know this until I saw this, where once the United States laid, laid the sanctions on Russia, that, that Putin immediately ordered all foreign foodstuffs to be crushed. Like they went into restaurants, they went into grocery stores, and if it was not Russian, they took it out yep. and they crushed it. And I thought, oh, wow, this is really interesting. And the guy said, for six months, we went through austerity and it was kind of hard. But after that happened, we had these vibrant food markets where there was local produce and you know local game and and, and it was like, wow, that's cancer. You know, that is cancer showing up, right? Yeah. And, and I think that not to say that we're going to go out and, you know, tear down all of our or, or, you know, crush all of our food that's come from other countries. I think that would be ridiculous. But there's something in there but start that, saying that no I think is really important. Maybe it's know? time to start saying no to it and start we working have, on it that, ourselves. Absolutely. No, that was a state-mandated no. Yeah. But maybe, we, but if we want to move away from the state, like we were talking about, it's time for us to individually start saying no to it and working on our it on ourselves, even if it's in a very small way. Well, here's you know why I think in America we do a lot better with yes, incentivization because we're kind of spoiled ah. in some ways. Yeah. So you know, like here in Austin, they have this stupid law where you've got to bring your bag to the grocery store. We have it there. You know, and whatever I do it, is it making a real difference? I don't, I don't know, but that's not really incentivizing. You know, right. what they should do is bring your bag to the grocery store, and we'll take twenty five cents off your purchase. You right. know, or, or every each bag sure. that you have. You right. know, no, you you know, or you know, every time you bring your bag, you, you know, you're in your car and you've got like a credit. You know, you, you have yeah. enough credit. You know, right now I'm sitting on about thirty bags, fifty bags. Things that I bought for a quarter because yeah. I didn't bring my damn bag. Those bags got to go somewhere at some point. Yeah. yeah. And guess what? They're plastic, right? Yeah. They're yeah. Plastic bags. I finally am starting to see some that are that are the inexpensive ones that actually are washable. Usually, just the more expensive ones are the washable ones. But yesterday, I saw in Whole Foods they have some of those ones that are just a dollar. They're actually washable now, so that's a little better. But so why don't we incentivize restaurants to have more local produce? Yeah. Lower their tax by. Yeah. You know, three percent. Yeah. So they're buying less from, you know, their their big just nationwide big pharma distributor, big agri distributor, and they're buying more farm to table. You know, why not incentivize people to, you know, grow gardens? Yeah, give people a tax credit if they get it, have a patch of edible stuff growing. As Absolutely. Absolutely. Instead, instead, if you're instead, able instead, to prove that you've got a garden, yeah. you pay less tax. Yeah, America. you know my answer to that is largely I don't like tax credits because I don't like the tax in the first place. I, I agree. remove that, I agree, but yeah. that's yeah, the purest. I, I get it. Well, let's, but let's find a way to incentivize instead but of taking. Yeah, yeah. As long as we're using this, as long, long as we're work using work the system, system like this, then that's the way to go. Absolutely. It, but to bring it into a local level, right? Make it, make it, you know, make it fun, make it enjoyable have some kind of monetary kind of exchange, whatever, you know. Some, also, some, also, people really need to start doing a lot more on the bartering front. And if people have 
vegetables and things that they've grown in their garden. They can trade with the restaurants for meals there. They can do that, you know, different. We, we need to become a lot more um, uh, interested in alternative ways of exchanging goods and goods and, and services. Well, I think we're on our way. I mean, we're yeah. destroying media, right? We're, we're television, you know, first it was TV. Well, TV got, you know, uh, supplanted by cable, right? People are getting rid of their cable. There's different programming involved. And that sets off a whole different trigger and a whole different wave, a whole different set of behavior patterns. So I think just from that level alone, we're starting to kind of move away from this, this dominating consciousness. Yeah. You know, and programming. Can I share something about programming real quick? Please. Okay. Uh, I had this realization uh, just a day or two ago. I was talking with a friend and I was, I was thinking about what my favorite movies were from the 1970s and the 1980s. And almost to a T, my favorite movies were apocalyptic and dystopian. Mm -hmm. And I love these movies. Yep. And I don't know why I love them so much. But I, you know, and they were there, and Charlton Heston was the king of dystopia. Yeah. Like he was, you know, Planet of the Apes, Omega Man, and even um, Soil and Green was quite dystopian in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Rollerball. And, yeah, yeah, exact Rollerball. There you go. I mean, I, I've seen I, I've seen Rollerball like ten times. I love that film. But yeah. so why? Why do I love these movies? And, and then I began to think about my life. And how it is, right? What am I interested in? I'm interested in conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. alternative theories, you know, getting beneath things. I've always been interested in the end of the world, you know, either consciously or unconsciously looking for doom, you know, in all the right places. Right. <laughs> you know, look, you know, and look at my and look at my my personal life. What do I do? Right. You know, I help people with astrology, kind of get through things. I'm not married. I have a kid, you know, I don't have like a a steady girlfriend, you know, I'm kind of living in a kind of post, you know, world in some ways, you know, I'm living in my own kind of version of dystopia, even though I go out and I've got relationships. I'm like, look how much these films and the media oh. have colored my personal choices. I would say different movies for me, but I would say that I know I noticed a while back the same thing also with certain music. Uh, music too, yeah. absolutely. I mean, they and, and they and they go, taking it down to a more direct kind of mind control level. They know that, and when in in, in MK Ultra and such projects, they do program people to specific songs, to specific songs. To specific oh, absolutely. Songs. And even to, specific, even to specific actors, maybe someone like Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston, classic point. I've yeah. done this. I've looked at this before. Christian Bale is another one. Christian of those. Bale. So, so I, I know someone personally who's been on this show who is completely uh, pro. We felt he was completely he, he, is, he's a, he is a total yeah. programmed kind of cipher trigger. Bradley yeah. Cooper is yep. another one. There's a bunch. There, there's a bunch. There, I mean, there's a, there's absolutely a bunch of them. Um, yep. One of the one of the big movies for me in that kind of apocalyptic way that was very affecting was uh, Fight Club. Oh, oh yeah. Fight Club, Fight Club was a movie that was a major Absolutely. program yep. kind of thing for me. Like, and I even had a revelation about it the other day. I have the most, I have revelations like at, at the most unusual times, usually when I'm at work doing some mundane activity, I was like literally going to the refrigerator to get some jalapeno sauce and I'm looking down at the bottle of sauces and I'm having this memory of like an underground Fight Club like scenario that like for myself that clicked to me why Fight Club was so programming and so triggering, right? And it was very, I'm just standing there at the jalapeno sauce thinking, oh my God, I went to Fight Club. And then I have to go right back out to work. And actually, I find that's the best way to process those memories as opposed to like getting stuck on them. Right. But yeah, those movies are, they're not there for an accident. It's not entertainment, it's programming. Well, I'll tell you what really brought this up for me is because my, my girlfriend is moving from uh, Arizona to Texas. Yeah. And she's single mom. Uh, her daughter will be uh, 13 in October. And she started to talk about films like Cinderella Liberty, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Oh, yeah. And all these kind of single mom films, you know, where the, where, um, uh, what was the, uh, uh, the TV show, Alice. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, Alice, which was from Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Uh, yeah. And, and, and so here she is. She's living out. Yeah. 
the seventies film. But that was also but, kind of that whole social near, social engineering aspect of, especially wide scale media like popular TV series. Yeah. If you look what happened between Ozzy and Harriet and The Simpsons, you had this. You, you had all in the family. You had these yeah. gradual stages of deconstruction until we get to the yeah. place where father doesn't know best, and now he's a complete asshole idiot. Well, well and- that, okay, so that's a really interesting time in American history. Yeah, it is. Because, because the, from Petticoat Junction and Beverly Hillbillies um, uh, and uh, Green Acres to all the family and, uh, and all the-, all the Archie Bunker Lear, and all that kind of stuff, yeah. The York and Lear properties, and then the, uh, the James- um, What's his name? The Meredith Tower, the MTM property, James Brooks properties. Yeah. Uh, there's a major sea change, and there's a name for it. It's called the Great Purge. Yeah. And the guy that was behind it was Brandon Tartikoff. And, yeah, and, absolutely. And, yeah. And, and they were clear that they what they wanted to do was to disassemble America. Yeah. Destroy the nuclear family. And I suspect Norman Lear was behind that as well. Norman although- Lear was a huge player in that, right? Yep. Because you have basically like like two branches, the James Brooks branch That's, with MPM and then yeah. the York and Lear branch. Yeah. So one of the on the on the Brooks side, it's always a little more sophisticated, right? It's yep. a little more middle class. Mary Tyler Moore, Rhoda, you know, Cloris Leachman, all that's yeah. the single woman. But it's all middle class taking place in Minnesota for the most part. Ed Asner. <laughs> Who can forget Ed Asner? Ed Asner. Yeah. On, the, on the Yorkin side and the Lear side, it's all working class. Yeah. Yeah. It's good times. It's it's all the family. It's Chico and the man. It's the Jeffersons. Yeah. You know, getting down into those. Two, two, kind of seven, things. all that stuff. Yeah. Well, it's Maud, right? Yeah. So it's a two pronged approach, really, to, you know, basically completely deconstruct the American family and to deconstruct the nuclear kind of core of America during the 1970s. Yeah. And at the same time, this is really interesting, like Michael Jones talks about this, which is fascinating, that that you have a rise of porn, right? Porn becomes really important during that time. Yeah. And and um drugs become important. But mm-hmm. at the same time, there's like what 23% interest, you know, coming from the Federal Reserve. So money is really hard to get. Uh, but you can have, you know, all the titties and beer you want, right? right? But that's going on simultaneously, too. It's a really interesting time and a real sea change for American culture and American consciousness. Well, I also think that same time, that time in the, like, in the late, early 70s, early to mid-70s and all that, that's really where programming kicked in, where programming really started to change, where I think many more um, different types of, of programming were deployed to catch certain kinds of each class or kind of, you know, um, group of people the, in the, something. The laboratories of MK Ultra basically went public. They went live. Yeah. They went to live yeah. operation and they went out into a much wider pattern, which obviously meant that they had to disperse, you know, energy is focused and then it starts to span out, but they yeah. had perfected the basics at that point so that what had worked in the laboratories at MK Ultra was now being deployed on a wide scale basis using the media, which took yeah. you from that, that 1970s period into the era of the VHS tape, which personalized yeah. media. That's porn became viable at that point because people didn't have to go to filthy CD theaters anymore. Yeah. They didn't have to go to peep shows and titty bars. They could do it in the privacy of their home. Gateway, internet, most internet. viable platforms even today, pornography. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. It, you know, if you go back into the, uh, the early 70s when all this is changing, right? Yeah. What, what else do you have musically? You have glam. And you have this, you know, um, kind of unisex look in Bowie and Bowling. Yeah. And, um, you know, coming from the femme side, you've got the runaways who look more like boys than they do girls. Right? Joan Jett. You have, the, you have, you have and, Joan Jett and you have uh, the pretenders and whatnot. And then you move into the sort of punk period, which um, people are starting to uncover more and more about how that was completely a, pro- completely a, a working of uh, intelligence agencies and think tanks. And then you have your kind of pop 
punk, like your Blondie and stuff like that, which is totally programming. It's great music, but it's totally programming and totally provocative. Yeah, it's hardcore, yeah. then softcore. They kind of take you, you know, yeah. punk, then new age. Or new wave, new sorry. Yeah, new wave. Yeah. Totally, totally new wave. Right. Yeah. yeah. And totally right. On and on and on up till present day, you have that going on with dance music and hip hop. And this but is Look at dance like, music. And honestly, I am looking at the spectrum of musical genres that are available right now. And you, Emily and I have talked about this. I can't keep up anymore. There's a hundred different genres within electronica alone. In dance music and house music and, and, and dub and trap and all this well, other stuff. We used to just have like trance and techno and drum and bass and house and, you know, maybe acid jazz. Voice. I mean, it just goes but on now, and on. Now you have such sub sub genres with the names, Robert, of twitch, glitch, trap. If that just the names imply what they're deployed to do. You know yeah, what right. I mean? Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I used to be in the music business. Yeah. And my, my world was um, world music and electronic music. I used to go to Miami. Yeah. Every year for Winter Music Conference. Uh, and I, you know, I listen to, to some extent, you know, electronic music. And yeah, it's changed, but has it changed all that much? You know, I, mean, I used to listen to like, you know, Glitch back in 2000, really. Yeah. And that's yeah. when it was around my It's, it's really just like changed with the, with the technology that they're using. The technology has changed, the for sure. The technology and then the, what they're, the kind of information that they're piggybacking and lacing on the frequencies that are running through that music is incredible. Yeah, no, the technology is like, you know, incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. What they're able to do with like the IDM stuff and just go wham, 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 and do all kinds of soundscape and, stuff. It's and there's a, bunch, there's a bunch of information and things embedded in that that is not apparent to people on a conscious level oh and yeah i think so yeah. yeah and that is very dangerous and uh, i spoke about that a little bit when i was on mark devlin's yeah, show backward backwards yeah. masking was Back just masking. that was the but that was a warm-up because of the way that, the technology yeah. works now the delivery system for subliminals is so much more intricate they can lace all kinds of frequencies in now and they also oh, some of those, some yeah. of those fre frequencies are, are frequencies that different kinds of energies can ride in on as well i mean there is just so much going on with yeah. that kind of psychotronic warfare and a frequency warfare and yeah oh, oh ab absolutely oh absolutely who was the who was the guy that was doing um uh what was it? he he what was dr Dr is his name dr dream Dr. Dre. No, 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 no. Dr. Oh. Dream, I know you're talking about. Dr. Yeah. Drew. No, Dr. Dream. <laughs> Dr. I think he's just stated it myself. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this guy was Kesha's producer, and okay. um, he produced yeah. a lot of, you know, uh, or, I, he might have produced Gaga, I think. Right. He, he was yeah. uh, a member of the Saturday Night Live band. Yeah, but this, this guy knew something. He like he he had like tapped into yep. some frequencies uh, yeah. that were definitely getting people very much hooked at a subliminal level. Totally. I mean, yeah, I, I completely believe that there's a whole bunch of I mean things being embedded, inscribed. Um, I think that they can use audio to plant visuals in people's heads. I think there's all sorts of things that are going on with that. That's um, very sophisticated. Very sophisticated. Back to the whole punk rock thing. Yeah. I think that just, just came right out of Tavistock. Totally. <laughs> You'll, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Go look at the key players. I mean, again, yeah. you know, intelligence operations. By the time you get to New Wave, you have the police, which is Stuart Copeland. Stuart Copeland's father. He was a CIA, CIA field officer. Miles Copeland was the point man between the Israeli Defense Force and the CIA. That's right. Operating out, out of Britain. Yeah. That's right. So, you, so you've got the, the scions of the CIA running one of the most popular yep. bands yeah. on the planet, having their own record label, IRS Records. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. That's why Randy hates taxes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think you'll find this over and over and over again. And um, I had a, was having a private chat the other day with Mark Devlin, who's working on his second book, his follow-up to Musical Truth, and he's going to have an entire segment. He just cannot believe how deep the rabbit hole is on punk and new wave music. And so, we uh, did you look at like like um, uh, Joe Strummer? Yeah. Joe Strummer's father was a uh, 
a diplomat. He used to live all over the world, right? So Joe Strummer's dad, and diplomats are basically spies. That's what yeah. they're really. That's of course, yeah. So Joe Strummer's dad is a diplomat, and Joe Strummer and his brother went to private school. They went to public school. And um, Joe Strummer's brother was older. And after he graduates from public school, he gets really into fascism mm -hmm. and, and becomes like a, he, he buys like a German paraphernalia and all kinds of stuff. And then one day his brother goes and takes a little rowboat out on one of the rivers and then he goes out on a little island by one of these rivers in, around London and puts a bullet in his head. I and mean, that's Joe Strummer's brother. And, and then they've got Bernie Morrison you know, who is like this, uh, you know, political operative, basically giving them, you know, um, you know, Karl Marx and underlining lines in Marx and handing yeah. it to Strummer and these guys write your lyrics. Malcolm McLaren, you know, what's that guy? What's that guy? Yeah, really? You know, yeah. Malcolm McLaren is one of the major wanna... players. We could do a whole show on this. Oh, totally. Yeah. Absolutely. And probably should. Maybe we'll get a round table together and get Mark Devlin on and get you on. And you could and, you, and, it would be interesting. We could bring up some of the characters and you could do some charts on them and Mark can tell us what he's found and Randy and I can add the things we know about the mind control aspects of it. It would be a fascinating show. That'd be great. I'd, I'd be really into that. Yeah. Cool. Well, you know, the only, the only guy out of the punk rock, out of the whole kind of music scene in England that said anything about Jimmy Savile while he was still alive uh, and his, and his activity was Johnny Lydon. Yeah. Or Johnny Lydon, public, public, and yeah. Yeah. yeah really good. Do you want to talk about image. the OA? That, so we, do you want to talk about the OA or do you want to just skip it for this time? We could do, people have been requesting us to talk yeah, about kind of. We're, let's break that off for a separate se yeah. segment because we're kind of coming up on, on yeah. two hours here. Yeah. Okay, well, that's cool. We'll talk I'd about like it. to get this out for folks uh, in timely manner for Ides of March, which yeah. means I got to burn some midnight oil here. So Okay, well, let's, uh, we can wrap it up. We've covered a lot of ground. Oh, we covered yes. a lot of ground. Yeah, always good great, stuff. Great. Yeah, we went to places I didn't expect to go to, and it, it's, it always works when you come on. Like we have a, we have a really good time with you, Robert. Always Robert, fun. yeah, no, we have we have great synergy, and I love I love hanging out with you guys. It's not even a broadcast; it's a hangout. Which is no, great. It's just a hangout. And uh, by the way, there is a link in your chat box, Robert. I put it up there about the original 13th Amendment. That I, I was saw correct. That I, opened it. I didn't want to okay. open it while we were talking, but yeah, I saw so that. So for the listeners and viewers, the listeners out there, because Emily's told me I can't put this out as video, um, <laughs> because <laughs> she doesn't have, have makeup on. Well, I don't have makeup on either, but... Yeah, but we decided... I thought we were the next, doing audio podcast hey, right now. Hey, baby, next time it's high heels and fishnet. Shopping. Okay, no fish nets, but all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, uh, and Robert, well, let people know where they can find you. I know you did some media scrambling here. You've kind of shifted your broadcasts around. Uh, give your website, yeah, so your broadcast. You went to uh, Spreaker. I used, I used, yeah, I used to be on Blog Talk. Now I'm on Spreaker. Uh, and it's got better sound quality, uh, ease of use. I mean, Blog Talk was so freaking Annoying. simple, but it was terrible. Yeah. So we were on Spreaker now, Monday through Friday. But Monday through Thursday at 9 a.m., I, I get on there and I and I uh, I kind of ran for about 30 seconds, 30 minutes. Um, and then on Friday, I have a longer show. Uh, sometimes I interview people. And then on a Sunday night, I do a, a live stream on YouTube that's all about astrology. And then my website is robertphoenix.com. And that's uh, and, astrology and, and then some. And cool maybe, Robert's, maybe Robert's a time operative like Randy and I, because he's an expert at time dilation. He took 15 minutes of flame, for, uh, flame and expanded it into 30 minutes. So I, that's right. I did. That was one of those moments. We did a gravity yeah, sure. well there. And yeah, we, that, yeah we got to. All right, my friend, it's been good having you on. Um, and we'll look forward to kind of getting you back on for another round, because this was just way too much fun. That's yeah. going to wrap it up for this time. This I'm is Off Plant. I'm sorry. This is Off Planet Radio. Truth is out there. <laughs> okay, just out there for tonight. <laughs>